Okay, now we will move on to agenda item number eight, Commission General Regulations Workshop, public comment allowed. Agenda item 8A, Commission General Regulation 485 Trag Tag Transfer Deference and Return Program, LCB file number R022-19, Management A Analyst Kylie Taylor for possible action. The Commission will hold a fourth workshop to consider a regulation relating to amending Chapter 502 of the Nevada Administrative Code. The regulation would provide direction for allowing the transfer, deference, or return of tags under certain extenuating circumstances after the passage of Assembly Bill 404 of the 80th Legislative Session. At the first workshop, the Commission directed the Department to narrow the options for the transfer or deference of a tag. At the second workshop, the Commission directed the Department to draft changes to the regulation encompassing the description of extenuating circumstance and a timeline to return the tag to the Department. At the third workshop, the department was directed to rewrite the regulation to allow for the transference of tags only in life-threatening circumstances. Ms. Taylor. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Um, as you stated, this is now the fourth workshop for this regulation, so I think most of you probably have a good sense of what it does by now. Um, and you should have the regulation in front of you, but I went ahead and made this PowerPoint mostly just the language so that it's clear for you because I know that regulation is kind of messy since we did a lot of changes to it. Um, and I did not have a chance to get this number updated for you guys because as I stated last time, it is a manual process and a lot of work for our data analysts and we had her do some work for the next regulation. So I just wanted, I just put this on here to remind you guys that these are kind of the numbers we're looking at. It probably doesn't vary too much year to year. Um, and I would imagine that eight for this year is a little bit higher now that most of the seasons have concluded. Um, I just don't have a number for you guys, so I apologize about that. So first, um, I added in the, the outbreak of disease and natural di disease occurs in wildlife populations. Um, that's the only thing that changed in section two. Um, do you want me to answer questions slide by slide or would you rather get through the whole thing? I, I would prefer to go through the whole thing okay. first. So that was it for section two. Section three says that in accordance with the requirements of this section, the holder of a tag who is diagnosed as terminally ill pursuant to NRS 449A.081 after being notified the tag was drawn, but before legal shooting hours on the first day of his or her hunt may transfer the tag to another person who is otherwise eligible to hunt a big game mammal in this state. So this is the only way someone could transfer a tag is if they were diagnosed as terminally ill. And I will read you guys that definition in NRS in case none of you have it. Terminally ill means a medical diagnosis made by a physician that a person has an anticipated life expectancy of not more than 12 months. So I chose that definition just because it was already defined in NRS. Um, if you guys would prefer a different definition of terminally ill or would like to use a different word even, um, we could do that, but this just made more sense in my mind. And I think it will protect us a little bit more legally, um, but that might be up to the DAG. <laughs> In accordance with the requirements of this section, the holder of a tag who incurs an extenuating circumstance provided in subsection three after the last business day before the hunt begins pursuant to NAC 502.422, but before legal shooting hours on the first day of the hunt may defer the use of the tag for the most similar privilege in the same management unit weapon class and hunting season the following year or return the tag to the department for restora restoration of any bonus points. So, um, we took the transfer of the tag out of this section and just solely had that with terminally ill. Um, these two defer and return can be done by a hunter if one of the extenuating circumstances occurs. And then this one states that <clears throat> if the holder of a tag chooses to return or defer the tag due to an extenuating circumstance, it has to be in accordance to the death of a family member of the holder of a tag or the holder of a tag or family member 
of the holder of the tag incurs an unanticipated severe catastrophic event, injury, or illness, which prevents him or her from hunting. Um, and this is the definition that we've talked about in the past. It just doesn't give the specific examples. And then I included the definition of hunting so that that's not questioned. And in NRS 501.050, hunting or its derivatives mean to search for, pursue, or attract any wildlife for the purpose and with the means of capturing, injuring, or killing that wildlife. Every attempt to capture, injure, or kill wildlife, and every act of assistance to any other person in capturing, injuring, or killing that wildlife. So then the next change is in subsection C. The holder is serving in the armed forces of the United States and is transferred to a location which makes it impractical, impracticable for the holder to hunt in that area, which the tag was issued as verified by a copy of his or her orders or other proof satisfactory to the department. And that hasn't been any um, major topic of discussion with this commission, but I included it in here. And then D and E were removed. And that was per year request, Chairman Johnston. Okay, so four would say, if a tag is transferred to another person pursuant to this section, both the holder of the tag and new recipient will be treated as if he or she drew the tag. Um, originally, we had written this so that just the original holder of the tag would lose the bonus points, um, but now it would be that both the original holder and whoever it's transferred to would lose their points. And then five um, is the same, there was no changes to it. The provisions of this section do not apply to someone who is serving in the armed forces. Uh, we added six and that is just saying that the holder of the tag has 14 business days after the start of their hunt to return the tag to the department and the department has five days to process that return. I don't recall much discussion last meeting um, on the number of days, so I just assumed those were good with you guys. We included in there that the department will give the commission an update on all tags that are transferred or, defort, or, defort, or deferred, I apologize. And then as used in this section, family member has the meaning ascribed to it in section one of assembly bill number 404, chapter 428. And that's included because um, the definition of family member is not specifically in this regulation, but it was specifically defined in that assembly bill. So basically the, that was the gist of the changes. The only other thing I did um, that wasn't in the PowerPoint is on page nine of the regulation. In section eight, um, subsection two, paragraph E, I deleted because that stated that um, it was the same thing as, as I previously showed where the commission and the department have the authority to um, say if any other circumstance qualifies and uh, we, you guys had requested to remove that so that there's no room for discretion. And that's basically the gist of this <laughs> regulation. Okay, any questions? Commissioner Hubbs. This is more a timing um, question, but the, this period of time in, at issue is from um, the business day before the first day of the hunt, and then there's a time where you shoot after that, but then there's a five-day window for you to process it, and I'm just wondering, how does the timing all come into play? So, um, I, I didn't include the timelines on this PowerPoint, I apologize, but we, in the last few PowerPoints, we've shown you that after the last business day before the hunt, um, it's an NAC, no one, if you return the tag after that time, you don't get your bonus points back. And there's currently nothing to do for people who return it after the last business day before the hunt up until their hunt begins. Um, but we have encountered these extreme circumstances for some people. So we are trying to accommodate them. Um, the five business days to get it to the department is because as Chairman Johnson has stated previously, um, if something like a death of a family member occurs or something happens to you, you can't necessarily contact the department right away. So we gave them, 
well, actually it was 14 days, I believe, for, to yeah. get their tag to us, and then the department has the five days to process that tag. Um, the only thing that might be a little bit difficult is if um, someone's diagnosed as terminally ill in that time, in that time period that I had listed, but um, wants to transfer their tag to someone, it's gonna cut out time in their season if they don't do it uh, relatively quick. But I believe that in that regulation, I wrote it so that if someone's diagnosed as terminally ill, after they drew the tag, which would be in May, they'd have up until the start of their hunt to transfer that tag to someone else. So that gives them a little bit more time to do that. Otherwise, um, returning the tag for a bonus point isn't a huge deal timing-wise, and deferring the tag to the next season also wouldn't be a huge issue timing-wise. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, any other questions? So let's take it out to public comment. Any public comment in Elko? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Jim Cooney, Elko Cab. Uh, this particular regulation is a prime example of why I think at one of your last commission meetings you were looking at uh, regulation simplification. Uh, this particular bill, when it was going through the legislature, uh, the complete intent of that was to be able to transfer a tag to a family member or something like that, and this thing is blown completely out of proportion. Uh, our Elko cab uh, was on record as opposing this, so I'd encourage you to uh, not support this particular uh, regulation and I guess refer it back to the legislature to get something closer to what was the original intent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment in Elko? No other comment. Thank you. Any public comment in Reno? No comment in Reno, Chairman Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Any public comment here in Las Vegas? For the record, Mike Reese from Clark County Cab. Um, we did this with two, two items on it. It was the uh, deference and uh, first come, first serve after the tag trial case. We addressed this all in the same. We voted six to nothing uh, to pass it be, uh, on the wording of that, but where our arguments came up is how do you issue a tag that's returned just because it's returned to get it back out? So we had a couple of discussions on that, I see that that's not on you guys' agenda here, so we did discuss that in our cab. So, and I thought I'd taken it straight off from the, the state's agenda, but obviously you didn't, but I'll reserve our comments for first come, first serve for another time then. Okay. Well, I believe the first come, first serve is the next agenda item. Okay, so then we, a, put, we a, put it Which together. is a different regulation. Okay, then I'll come on back up after. Okay, so Thank did, you. did the Clark County cab take a position on this regulation on tag transfer and deference? Yes, we did. We voted six to nothing on it. To support it? In support of it, yes. Okay. Mr. Hyatt? John Hyatt with Clark County Cab. I would just point out that if the death of a relative is an issue here and you have to su supply a death certificate, can be within 14 days it can be pretty hard to get that sometimes any other public comment here in Las Vegas okay so now I'll bring it back to the Commission uh, one question I thought it was and maybe I read it wrong. I have 14 days to return the tag. I take it then I can follow up with the certificate of death to prove the extenuating circumstance. Yes, and then I can also include um, at the end of that, uh, the, with the proof of the death certificate, I could add comma um, upon receival. 
All right. Further questions or comments? I, um, I do share some of the concerns of the Elko cab that this is not the most simplified version of a regulation. I understand that. Um, but I also know the tag transfer legislation started off very different than where it ended in that we have had uh, stakeholders talk about giving an opportunity, for instance, to transfer a tag um, when there is illness or to somehow address some of these extenuating circumstances that arise at a period in time where a person is not afforded the opportunity to return a tag and it seems that it does happen. And so I'm, I'm mindful of Elko's comments. I, I would have liked to have heard an alternative um, because a lot of work has been put into this and I'd like to be able to do something to address these circumstances. And I think we have gone through this numerous times and have gotten to the point where we are not opening up Pandora's box, but trying to address limited circumstances that justify the deference, transfer, or return of a tag in very limited circumstances. Um, Deputy Director Rob, did you have something to add? Yes, Jack Rob, for the record. The way the regulation currently reads, if passed, addresses 95% of the issues that I can think of that came up in the past couple of years. A first responder that was an injured young man that uh, had an elk tag and was unable to go into the field that year. And they were looking for a way to ensure that a young man trying to help out the citizens injured as a first responder could go on an elk hunt the following year. That, that's covered under this. Uh, a gentleman that spent $170,000 on a desert bighorn sheep tag while he had ALS that by the time the hunt started, he was unable to effectively go into the field and wanted to transfer it to his son. That is covered. A gentleman that had 13 bonus points on mule deer draws an area 13 tag. His dad dies in New York. He's covered. There's things that, these are tough calls on the department. They'll call counter staff first, and then it works its way up. And then I have to be the bad guy and tell me, no, I understand everything going on, and I, I sympathize with you, and if there was something I could do, I would do it. But all the circumstances that I can think of that I've had to be the final bearer of bad news the past few years are covered by the way the regulation reads now. I understand that Elko wanted to go back and... I think the legislation really started out to benefit uh, NGO organizations to get wounded warriors or uh, children into the field that have some type of sickness. So that's where it really started and it morphed into this. But I do see an application that this could have really helped us in the past few years. Um, I would also like to add, Mr. Chairman, just this last weekend, I was working our sheep show booth, and I met a gentleman who told me he was hospitalized right before his hunt began and then was diagnosed with cancer and told me he wished that we had something in place that would have addressed his case. Um, so you can imagine his surprise and pleasure when I told him that we were working on something. Vice Chair East. Thank you. And, and you're correct. The, the original legislation um, was exactly as Deputy Director Rob suggested, and I think got caught up in a political Game. parlay <laughs> yes. of sorts um, and ended up here. And they, the legislature did leave it to us to define extenuating circumstances. And I have to say that as much as we've worked on this, I think this is as close to what we're gonna get as we're gonna get at this point. And maybe with a few more years under our belt, we may come back and simplify this a little bit based on some of the um, situations that come up. But I feel comfortable approving this today and I appreciate all the work that you've done, Kaylee. Thank you. Thank you. 
Commissioner Olmberg. Yeah, I can, you know, when it comes to Elko and, and White Pine County, both cabs, I mean, it, this wasn't their, their idea at all. But that doesn't mean that this isn't a good program itself. It's something completely different, and maybe that ball gets, that, the original ball gets rolling again the next legislative session, because it's, it's not this. But this is still a very good program. I think it, it captures all, the, all of our discussions, and uh, I, I'm in full support of it. I think, I think it's good. Any other comments or questions? This is a workshop, so I don't know if we need to take formal action or we can just put it on the agenda for an adoption hearing in March. Okay. With that, then we'll move on to item 8B, Commission General Regulation 490, party bonus points. And first come, first serve. LCB file number 103-19, Division Administrator Kimberly Munoz and Management Analyst Kylie Taylor for possible action. The Commission will hold a workshop to consider a regulation relating to amended cha amending Chapter 502 of the Nevada Administrative Code. The regulation would allow customers to purchase a bonus point for a type of hunt for a season that is not open. The regulation also addresses bonus points for sportsmen who apply as a party. Lastly, the regulation would allow a first come, first serve opportunity for return tags that miss the 14 day deadline to be awarded to the alternate list. Ms. Taylor, Ms. Munoz. Um, okay, thank you, Chairman. I'm going to start with an apology because this regulation came out of the TAC committee um, and in part of the draft regulation, um, I believe the TAC committee wanted to be able to let non-residents apply for hunts that were not open, for example, our mountain goat hunt. And I did have that language included in the draft, uh, but it did not make it into the regulation that came back from LCB and I missed that until someone brought it up to me today. So that's not in there and it's definitely easy to add that if you guys would like the ability to do that for non-residents. I have my draft language in front of me. So I can certainly add that into the regulation that would go for adoption if you'd like. Um, I will leave that up to you, but I just wanted to start with that. We can continue. Well, I, I do know that was something that came out of the TAC committee. Uh, I was still on the TAC committee when that issue first came. And I know some of the concerns to be addressed with that is there may never be the non-resident hunt for certain species in which people are applying. There's also a concern that there are non-residents who may have accrued bonus points that are still in place. And if, the, the, if they can then be eligible to draw and don't take the opportunity because they're not aware of it, could end up losing their bonus points if they don't apply for two consecutive years. So this gets into some of the application bonus point complexities that just exist. And so I just wanna alert everyone to that. And I know that's only one part of this reg. If we have questions on that, we can pose them now or move on to the rest of the regulation, which is I believe the party hunt and uh, the first come first serve. Any questions on the first issue? Commissioner Hubs. So are you, I'm, I'm just confused by how it was phrased at first. You're saying that we're allowing non-residents to apply for a hunt that they will never be drawn on? N not necessarily. So right now there's no non-resident tags, for example, for mountain goat. And because we don't ever get to the level of 10, but maybe someday we, we might. I don't know if that's gonna happen, but it was people who came and said, you know what I'd like to be able to do is get bonus points, even if there's no non-resident hunt, I wanna buy my bonus point, so that if there ever is the non-resident hunt, I go into that draw and I may have 15 bonus points, and I'm willing to pay for the bonus point, to have that opportunity uh, if there is ever a, a non-resident hunt on these species. That came, I forget where it came from. It was, I don't believe the TAC committee itself. It came to the TAC committee 
either from a non-resident or someone who moved out of state or something and said, I, I want to buy a bonus point. And we said, and I think the tech committee is like, well, why not if people want to do that and have an understanding that we may not ever have the non-resident hunt, let them afford them, let's afford them that opportunity. It's very forward thinking. <laughs> <laughs> By, by the non-resident. If, if in the hope that this hunt ever occurs, I'd like to have advantage when I go into the draw. Yes. How many non-residents would actually buy the opponent's point? I have no idea. One that we know of. <laughs> Any other questions on that? Okay. Without, then are we switching over to Ms. Munoz on this? We'll be switching off. Okay. For the record, Kim Munoz, Division Chief of Data and Technology Services. This is my first presentation here, so I apologize if I make it awkward. <laughs> um, we're doing a couple of changes with this particular reg, so we just listed out some of them um, in a summary. So we're looking to change um, for the youth hunt right now, currently, it's my understanding that you have to be 12 before the start of the first season. We want to change that so that um, they can apply for a bonus point as long as they're 12 before the start of the last season of the specific species in which they're applying. We also want to make a change to the bonus points that will be awarded um, so that it specifically states in here that you only get one bonus point per license that you have. Um, Let's see, military members may have bonus points restored if they've been deployed uh, or out of the country during the time for their two consecutive years um, if they could not apply. If the tags were returned, oh, so this is the party um, one that the entire party needs to return their tags in order to get the bonus points restored and then the first come first serve. So the first change in this regulation is the youth age requirement change. Current NAC states that children 12 years of age may apply to hunt or apply for a bonus point only if they turn 12 before the first day of the earliest season for the species for which they're applying. So for example, Emily turns 12 on September 1st and wants to apply for antlered mule deer rifle in unit 021, which has a season of December 21st to January 1st. In this scenario, the earliest season is August 10th, so Emily is not eligible to apply for a bonus point. If, we, if this re regulation were to pass, the NAC would say that children under 12 years of age may apply for a bonus point if they turn 12 by the first day of the latest season. So again, Emily turns 12 on September 1st and wants to apply for that antlered mule deer rifle hunt in unit 021. Um, in this scenario, the latest season is December 11th, so Emily can apply for that bonus point because she turns 12 on September 1st. Um, we also threw this in here so you guys have a little bit of information to go behind this. In 2019, Hunter's education courses showed that 201 kids who took Hunter Ed in 2019 had a date of birth between August 1st and December 31st. So that number is not necessarily accurate because some kids who were um, under 12 may not have taken Hunter Ed yet. They might be taking it this spring. So I would imagine that number would be even greater going into next season, which would give over 200 kids the ability to apply for a bonus point um, when they were previously not able to. And, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I received a call a while back from a gentleman who was like, so under the regs, my daughter can apply for the hunt but doesn't want to, but can't apply for the bonus point because her birthday's after the first season. Mm -hmm. and, and his statement to me was, it doesn't make any sense that she could actually put in and apply for a hunt and be awarded a tag, but couldn't just have the option to apply for the bonus point if that was gonna work best for their particular scenario. And that's how that came about. Um, and it just it was just something that existed in the regulations. Right. Okay. So in this particular one, we are, um, let's see, 
regardless of the number of applications to obtain the tag or bonus point for the season submitted by a person, the department shall not award one person more than one bonus point per season for each species or category of species for which the person applied. So the example with the current NAC is Tom purchased his license in June 1st of 2019 in order to apply for the second draw. He is unsuccessful and he gets a bonus point. Tom's license is still valid for the 2020 big game draw and he receives a bonus point if he's unsuccessful. This particular scenario, Tom received two bonus points on the same license. So with this proposed um, change to the regulation, we're going to actually limit the number of bonus points to one per hunting season for each species um, or categories of species which the person applies. So if Tom purchases his license on June 1st of 2019, he's unsuccessful, he receives his bonus point, he will need to renew his license before the 2020 big game draw. And then he could get the, the second bonus point because he renewed his license. Right, so it would be one for one. Um, we did do the numbers on these and we had a couple dozen, I think it, the number was around 39 last year in this scenario where they were applying for the second draw and then they used that same license to apply the next year. Okay. Um, as far as the military portion of this regulation, uh, it's just a new section to this because to this NAC, it didn't exist previously. So the department would reinstate bonus points to an active member of the armed forces of the United States if they show proof that they were mobilized or deployed outside of the United States and were therefore not able to apply for a bonus point during that two years. Um, we gave an example, Sergeant Munoz has nine desert bighorn sheep points before being stationed in Germany in 2018, then was deployed for training in 2019. He was unable to submit big game applications during 2018 and 2019, so he's currently subject to losing his points. With the new regulation, his points could be reinstated once he returned and showed that proof. with the party bonus points. So the current NAC, if a tag is received um, at least one business day before the opening of the season in which the tag was issued, the department shall, except or otherwise provided in this section, treat the applicant with respect to his or her eligibility to obtain a tag and to be awarded the bonus point if the tag has not been issued and the applicant was unsuccessful. Um, the tag shall uh, shall not return the fee paid for the tag. In this scenario, Colton submits a party application for himself, his brother, and grandfather John, who doesn't hunt. Colton has two bonus points, Elijah has two bonus points, and Grandpa John has six bonus points. As a party, they have 10, which is divided um, amongst the three party members, averaging 3.3 points. Um, this rounds up to four bonus points each. They are successful in the draw, but Grandpa John returns his tag and he gets an additional point. Colton and Elijah hunt and they're successful. So the next year, Colton and Elijah have zero bonus points while Grandpa John now has seven. Um, next year, if they apply as the same party, they will average three bonus points each even though that they were successful in the previous year. So in 2018, we had 197 party members who returned a tag. And in 2019, we had 161 party members of which at least one of them returned a tag. So with the change, if every tag awarded for antelope, bighorn sheep, mountain goat, black bear, turkey, deer, moose, and elk awarded to the members of the party is returned for a reason other than the reasons set forth in subsection one and two, and every tag is received at least one business day before the opening day of the season for which the tags were issued, the department would treat each applicant in the party with respect to his or her eligibility to obtain a tag or be awarded a bonus point as if the tag had not been issued and the applicant was unsuccessful and will not return any fee paid for the tag. So in this example, Colton submits the party application for himself, his brother, and his grandfather, who doesn't hunt, Colton has two bonus points, Elijah has two bonus points, and Grandpa John has six. As a party, they have 10 bonus points, again, divided by the three members, averaging 3.33 points. This would round up to four, as Kim previously stated. They are successful in their draw, and Grandpa John returned his tag. Grandpa John gets no bonus points for that tag, for returning that tag, unless Colton and Elijah both return their tags as well. 
So if Colton and Elijah decide to hunt on that tag, next year Colton and Elijah and John will all have zero bonus points going into the big game um, application period. If Colton and Elijah decide to return their tags, next year Colton and Elijah would have three bonus points and John has his seven. Um, these are the data that we had previously shown you as far as return tags. Um, I just included those in this PowerPoint. You guys have seen it because I gave it to you in the previous regulations PowerPoints um, at previous commission meetings. Again, that's the value of the returned tags in 2018. Um, I think this just goes to show that not only are is there an opportunity for more money, which is the least important to us, but um, more people could be out in the field if we were able to reissue these bar par reissue these returned tags um, on a first come first serve basis. So that brings us to first come, first serve. Uh, let's see, the current NAC, the department has no more than 14 business days um, or more remaining until the opening of the opening day of the first hunt. Select an eligible applicant for the alternate list for the hunt and season who has a drawing number with the highest priority and indicated his or hers first choice of the area and the season for which the quota is being filled. filled. Um, in this particular scenario, Lynn's sheep tag opens on August 15th, but her boss has told her that she needs to work during the entire season. She returns her tag on August 13th. This tag will not be reissued to anyone on the alternate list because it was returned less than 14 business days before the hunt began. So if this regulation were to pass, it would say the department shall, if 14 calendar days, which was changed because currently it says business days, um, if 14 calendar days or, or more remain until the opening day for the hunt, select an eligible applicant from the altern alternate list who has the drawing number with the highest priority and has indicated that hunt as his or her first choice. The department shall provide all eligible hunters with an opportunity to apply electronically for any tags that are remaining after the computerized drawing and alternate list, the department shall provide all eligible hunters with an opportunity to apply for any remaining tags electronically or returned 14 calendar days or less before the opening day for that season. The department shall act upon applications for those such tags in the order received. If an application for a tag described in subsection one is successfully drawn, the department will collect all applicable fees and charges for that license if the applicant does not already have one. So for example, Ron returned his antler deer tag with an October 5th start date on September 23rd. This tag cannot be reissued to the alternate list because it was returned within that 14 day period of the start date. Ron's return tag will be posted to the license vendor's website for whomever claims that tag first. That's the basis of this regulation. I know it does a lot of things, so we are open for questions. Has the, have we looked historically just out of curiosity to see if the return of the party tag has increased since it's been discussed so many times over the last six years and people figured out how to do it, or do we know? I'm, ju I'm just curious about that because this has been something that's been discussed yeah. since. 19 was lower. Yeah, the, eight, the 2018 numbers were a little bit higher by about 30 than the 2019 numbers. We had a little, about 30 less return. Okay. But we only, we only went back, pulled two years. Okay. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Olmberg. Yeah, I guess there's uh, a lot of the, the, the concerns that got raised in White Pine and Cab anyway comes to how do we go about and first come, first serve. Are we, is there uh, ways that people can sit there and say, hey, I'm turning my tag back in uh, now, and so you get on the, online and apply? Or is there technical uh, capabilities to have someone nonstop do a program that's constantly hitting or, you know, constantly trying to get in there to be that guy, the next guy? And are we open and, is that a possibility? 
How do we do it fair? I mean, that, I mean that's the biggest question here. Is, is there a way to do this fair to prevent those type of uh, activities from happening? For the record, Kim Munoz, uh, what we had talked about was having it randomized. So when somebody did return it and it was processed as when it was posted and available in the queue, you would have to be logged into your account in the Calcomy system in order to even see the queue and what's available. Um, and then have it as a randomized time so that it couldn't be that any person would know when that would tag would come up to become available. So as we get 14 days prior to the start of a certain season, you log in and you keep it there and you hit the refresh button. And, if, and once it hits, it's, once it's hit, whoever clicks, <laughs> whoever clicks the mouse the fastest, I take it. That would be correct. Ch Chairman Johnston. Yeah. Jack Grove, for the record. Uh, we understand what White Pine County's concern is. And when that tag's returned, the department will have up to three days to notify Calcomy that that tag has been returned. It could, we could process it in as little as six hours. We could process it right up to that third day. When we give it to Calcomy, we've asked if Calcomy could put in a random sequence then in a 12 hour period after that tag is returned, that it will go up in a random order. So even if a department staff knew it was coming up, it could come out at two in the afternoon or two in the morning. It could come out any time of day and you have to be logged into your account and you have to put it in your cart. And it's the first guy that gets it in his cart, protects it. And once it's protected, he can only protect it for a limited amount of time, whether it's five minutes or 15 minutes before that transaction times out. And if I got it in my cart, if I'm in a waiting period for bighorn sheep, I can't put it into my cart and then transfer it to my son's cart that's not in a waiting period. It has to be in the cart to the person that's eligible for that hunt. So waiting periods apply. Uh, if you do buy that tag, bonus points will be subtracted. It's going to be just like a regular tag. Um, this isn't a new idea for, it's a new idea in Nevada, but the way that the department became familiar with this was at a chronic wasting sampling station in Ely, when Coney McGinney had a friend come by from Colorado, or he was out of California, come back from Colorado with a monster antelope that he bought on a first come first serve. So Cal Colorado has done this, they've been successful with it, and we've looked at multiple ways to ensure the integrity of this, that nobody could game the system by having to be logged into the account to put it into their cart. If we posted a list, it would be the first person to get logged in. It, 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 you've got to be in your account. It's going to drive traffic to our site. It's going to change our flow during those times. You know, before elk season starts, before sheep season starts, we all know Sheep season usually starts November 20th, so from November 6th through the 20th, people are going to be hitting that site on a regular basis because we have, as you know, better than 10 sheep tags returned. And we had a Rocky Mountain sheep tag returned last year that did not go into the field. So we're trying to get people into the field with the limited number of tags we have. We had 74,000 applicants last year for 30,000 tags. We had 1,100 tags get returned that did not go into the field. We need to do a better job getting those tags into the hands of the customers that want to get into the field. Kaylee Taylor again for the record. Um, I also would just like to add to this regulation. Um, during my time working the sheep show, I had multiple people ask if we did a first come first serve program. So there is a great interest for this. Commissioner Cavillio? Um, I guess I completely independent, uh, even though I'm from White Pine, but completely independent of White Pine, I have the same concern about exactly how it's going to work. Um, how Do we know exactly how Colorado does theirs? Because they've done it for a while. Um, do we have any idea how they do theirs? Their first come, first serve? Not the individual particulars, but we have worked with people that work with them to see how it works. We can reach out to Colorado and make sure that we can get rid of all the bugs. Uh, 
a lot of it wouldn't be covered in regulation. It would be covered in workflow and how we put together the workflow. And we're going to have to ensure that our staff has some confidentiality. I don't want to have a sheep tag returned and have them go up and down the hallway saying, hey, a 161 sheep tag just got returned. Do you want it? It's going to be coming up. We're going to have to have some safeguards internally to make sure that doesn't happen. And we're, we're, it, we're really going to have to tighten up the way it works. But putting in that random nature, putting in the first guy that gets it into his cart and a timeout on the cart, and you can't transfer it from one cart to the other. Even if I knew John returned an elk tag, Commissioner Allenberg returned an elk tag, uh, my chance of being the one to know over a three and a half day period it, you'd have to, it, it's going to be so random, even if I knew somebody was bringing it in, uh, there's going to be other people looking that are going to have a chance to put it in that shopping cart. I, I guess my other concern would be too, you got, you got the big license application guys too that have thousands of clients and I wouldn't put, people are very creative and I wouldn't put it beside them to, you know, somebody on the staff just mining that thing nonstop, refreshing it nonstop, refreshing it nonstop, and then all of a sudden I get a text message from Huntful or Epic Outdoors, hey, there's a Nevada tag, and then it's a, it's a rat race to get on there to who can, who, like you said, it's a race to who can get on there to buy that tag, but um, I guess I'm not, it's a little funky, it, it's just a little awkward for, to me to do it that way too. I don't know exactly, that's why I was asking about how Colorado does it. Um, because people get extremely creative. I think we all know yeah. that. But. Jack Rowe, for the record, we understand that. And uh, we understand we might make a first attempt at this, and we might need to revisit this after our first year. This is an idea that we want to throw out there. Uh, I understand the hunting fool and the epic outdoors, but they still have to get to the client that wants a 24 deer tag and have that client get it into their shopping cart. And in that amount of time, the chances of somebody else grabbing it and getting into their shopping cart is probably fairly high. So you have to match client with particular want and need with a window that's so small to get into the field. I mean, they're gonna have to go with well less than two weeks notice a lot of times because a good portion of these tags are returned in two or three days before the season starts. We have some other things that we want to do and we'll talk about it tomorrow more to drive down the number of tags that are returned on that last day. This year after the draw goes, in the past we would charge your card and as soon as the cards went through we would start processing those tag fulfillments. This year we're going to put in a seven day window from the notification to fulfillment that you can return the tag electronically. Last year I drew a cow elk tag. I knew the second I drew it, it was going to be returned because of conflicts or other things I had going. But I had to wait for Calcomite to print that tag to mail it to me, for me to get it to, into my mailbox, to take it down to get it returned, to go through the process we have in our office, to get it back to Calcomite, to get to the alternate, to print it, to mail it. It was 25 to 30 days between me knowing I was gonna give it back to the next person getting that tag. So we're trying to streamline that process with another process. So we're, I think some of the people that are returning those tags with two days left before the season knew earlier, but we can see it in our big game application trends. Everybody knows the need to apply, but our last two days are when it occurs. So I think some people procrastinate putting it in. So we're trying to drive the number of people that do it that way and get, get it into the alternate list and shrink that list of the two day people. The other thing with this, if I turned in a tag this afternoon at four o'clock and there was a season starting tomorrow, even though that season started, we're still going to have the three days and the 12 hours. We are going to, if first come first serve works, be selling tags to people on a season that's already started. 
because there will be people that will buy them. So we're trying to get people in the field. That's the main goal of what we're trying to do here. That resource has already been accounted for in the models. The resource can absorb that impact on it. We want it. We're, you know, like I said, 74,000 applicants for 30,000 tags. We've got to do something to get that extra 1,100 into the field. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Jack, was there any conversation about um, having like little mini draws? Um, example, tag is uh, uh, brought in within the 14 day period and um, people are checking their thing and it basically that that tag's sitting out there and it says, hey, if you're interested, you got, you know, four hours, eight hours, 12 hours to express your interest. And then at the end of that 12 hours or whatever period of time, you shut it down and then you do a little mini draw with the people that, that logged in and, and uh, done that. Rather than a first come first serve, it's kind of like more of a, you know, everybody that expresses a, a, an interest in it in that real short period of time, it's just like this little quick draw. You see what I'm saying? Yes, Jack Rob, for the record, we've talked about mini draws. We've talked about, uh, I've had people just this week say, well, you've already got an alternate list and they've checked the box saying they want to be an alternate in excess of two weeks. Why don't we take it down and they can be an alternate up to the day the hunt starts or five days into the season. But then you have to give them 24 or 48 hours to let them select. You've got to notify them and you got to wait 12 hours and select those become just nightmares for the agency and, and Calcomai trying to do notification of people and do everything. Uh, when you get into short windows, you're better off people coming to you saying, yes, I want it, instead of going to 10 different people saying, do you want a cow elk tag that may have a 10 day season? Do you want it tomorrow and have to go through that five times? Antelope seasons are really short. Sometimes we have short cow seasons. Uh, we have some deer seasons, uh, northern Washoe that stack on top of each other. They're 10, 11 days long. So you put one of those processes that you just explained in, that tags don't go and get into the field because of the cumbersome nature that we just put into it. So, so, so we, we know that this isn't perfect, but we're trying to do something that we can adjust in the future. So Jack, I'm not, I'm not really talking about anything that would require uh, notification back to uh, back to somebody letting them know that it's there it would be basically the same thing a tag is returned um, it's put into the system that basically says uh, it's up to people to check it um, just like it would be on the first come first serve and if they see that it's in there then rather than trying to be the first one to put it into their cart they just say they, they check a box on the system and say yeah I want to be part of this little mini draw whatever and after a period of time that it's basically advertised as having been returned, um, Calcomai runs a little program, runs the name, and that kind of takes away some of the concerns with, uh, hey, make sure that you get on at 12.01 because a tag's returned. Uh, you know, odds of that happening are slim, but, you know, if perception is everything. You see what I'm saying is that it wouldn't require any other, it's basically the same process. You're just allowing more people into that opportunity um, might help alleviate some of the other, the other issues. So. It, it seems like uh, it would work, but you try to do that 1,100 times with 1,100 mini draws. That, that could, it, that, that <laughs> we would, you start doing that, Calcomai wouldn't do that for free, and we could start exceeding the amount of revenue that that tag could generate to make, have them do 1,100 mini draws. It, 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 we, we complicate it so much. Uh, like I said, this is an idea. It's something we're trying to make better. If you guys have additional ideas, that's why we're workshopping this, but we'd like to have it into effect this year. So if we workshop it too many times, we're not going to get it through Ledge Commission for even something to start with that we could adjust once we see the problems. But sometimes, uh, it takes three years for your sportsman to really figure out if you've changed the game on them. The first year, a few people figure it out, but to get your 
rank and file sportsmen to get something figured out when we change. It's it's a it's a time process. So the first year we might not find the bugs. It might be the second year that people learn how to game the system. You know, return a tag for any reason and people having grandma apply for a deer tag to start getting bonus points. It wasn't thought of the first year. It took a little bit of time and now more people are figuring it out. And uh, I think the number would be bigger, but none of the party drew a tag is why we're not seeing the growth in it like you had uh, asked about Mr. Commiss or Chairman Johnston, because even though they're in a party with weighted bonus points, they're still not drawing. So they, it, it gives them an advantage, but it's not a guarantee, but we're just looking to do something better and it won't be perfect the first year, I can tell you. Commissioner Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How, Jack, how would you envision like the first batch of these tags going through? So at 14 days, you've got so many tags returned from then to the 11th day. They go to somebody's cart, somebody buys that first come first serve tag. What if that person then chose to give the tag back? Is it once you buy it, that's yours? no restoration of bonus points and you're committed to the purchase or could they potentially turn that back in? Jack Roth for the record, if they returned it prior to the start of the season, they could get their bonus points back just like normal. Prior to the last business day before the hunt begins. Yeah, exactly. Thank <laughs> you. Unless there's an extenuating circumstance. Right. Exactly. Right. Thank you. <laughs> so if it was, if it was a, 11 days before that they bought it, and then it was two days before that they turned it back in, their bonus points would be restored, and then that would go back out to the first come, first serve list again. So we would just continue cycling it through until yes, the start correct. of the season. Yeah, I, yes. I, I like the idea. I understand the details will have to be worked. I like the idea of the first come, first serve just because the demand for tags exceeds the supply. And to have a situation where you have a thousand tags just are not being used that could give people opportunity to get out, uh, I think we should try to address that situation to give the opportunity to those who obviously want it. And I think we'll see these tags being picked up by individuals uh, just because of, you know, the, we do not have enough opportunity to meet the full demand. So it, we've 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 talked about this a lot. It is uh, for possible action. I would like to try to take it out to public comment unless there's additional questions. Commissioner East, I have a quick question about the party tags. So three people go in on a party tag. If one person returns the tag, the other two still hunt? Yes, they can still I thought hunt. the whole party had to go, not to, always together, but they have to go and hunt and they can't return a tag. Mm -mm. No. Currently, um, I don't like that. if a party were to drew, draw a tag, uh, however many could return that tag and however many can go hunt as they wish, um, the people who return their tag would get their bonus points back and the people who decided to hunt on that tag would just be treated as if they were a successful person drawing a tag. Okay. Commissioner Valentine. Yeah, I think historically, um, when we looked at this, but I think it was probably 2015 or 16, the number of people that were turning their tags on a party application were somewhere around 60. At the time, we didn't feel it was a major issue. That's why the tag allocation hunt committee didn't address it. But I think obviously it's become an issue at this particular point in time. So I'm comfortable with the party situation as stated in this break. Yeah. Commissioner Olmberg. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm all for getting these tags back in hands, getting that opportunity, whether it be the first come, first serve, or, or a combination. Uh, I hate to abandon, abandon the thought of, of maybe we can accommodate some of these people that, in fact, it was their choice, that, like in a, on the alternate list there, is with, a, with a, if we ask them a second question, hey, are you interested in this short time period within this 14 days, are you still interested in the tag? Because if you take the tag, you're losing everything. And then if it comes back in the system and it's still there and there's nobody left on that alternate system that is willing to take a short-term tag, then it goes to a uh, first come, first serve. Deputy Decker, Rob. We've thought about that and uh, we would have to ask that it would, because if you take a tag on say an animal punt and you're an out-of-state person or you're a resident, it could change how you want that tag. And we've looked to have a one-day FedEx from Dallas, Texas to Reno, Nevada, it's like $65. So to incentivize Calcomy to have the turnaround, we're thinking about a $100 fee to have that tag overnighted if you request to have it overnighted. But if you don't request to have it overnighted, you could come into an Endow office and pick that tag up the next open business day. So depending on where you, and I understand what you're saying, to go down the list further, and we could we can write that in, That that that's an option. We can use the alternate list and say, hey, your, your, this season could be open as long as five days before you receive your tag. But do you want to go pick it up at an Endow office or do you want it FedEx to you? And we can go that direction too. Our goal is to get these tags into people's hands. We're just looking for the vehicle on how to get those tags in the end. So if we want to have a checkbox that said, I'll take a tag with two weeks left, and then another checkbox that says, I'll take a tag even if there's five days already off in the season and send it to me FedEx for an extra hundred bucks. We can try to program that in. So you tell us what direction to go. We'll, we'll try to get there. Uh, we're just throwing this out for thought. This is an idea. If you have a better idea, let's run with it. But we want, we want to get these tags back out. I'm just thinking again, trying to give opportunity because not everybody's going to have the time. You know, some of these guys that really want that tag, they would be willing to do that. They're not going to have the time to be checking in, as opposed to some of these these uh, you know these agencies that that's what they do is you know they they get tags for people, and so it's just that's my thoughts. Anyway. Okay. All right. Well, let's take let's do public comment starting in Elko. Mr. Chairman, Jim Cooney, Elko Cab. Uh, our cab was opposed to this particular regulation, but listening to the discussion, uh, Commissioner Altenberg, uh, I think is on the, the right track. Uh, our cab was concerned with the first come, first serve, and how that could be implemented, uh, the chances of uh, uh, messing with the system, if you would say. Uh, we wanted it to be specifically off of the alternate list and listening to what Deputy Director Rob has said with the 14 days, if you eliminated the 14 days, anyone who put in for an alternate tag in that 14 day window, even up through, as you said, Mr. Chairman, uh, five days into the season, let's utilize that uh, to distribute those tags back rather than go into the first come, first serve. If the entire alternate list is diminished and you get through all of those, then if you want to try the first come, first serve. But um, I can see some real issues coming up, uh, whether it's with Cabela's tags or those companies that are uh, looking at tags all around. So. I'd urge you to look at the specifics of the alternate and that 14-day period 
exhaust all of the names on the alternate list before you go to anything first come, first serve. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment in Elko? No further comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any public comment in Reno? I got to press a button. Nope, go ahead. Yes, Rex Flowers speaking for myself. Um, to remind you, uh, Chairman Johnston, that application for the closed seasons was actually done through a guide here in Washoe County at the Washoe Cab. Um, I don't favor that program personally. Um, as far as the first come, first serve uh, program goes, um, I'm, I like the idea. I think once you get within the 14 days, it does come down to trying to afford opportunity to as many people as we can. Uh, those tags are there to be sold, and uh, you're always going to have somebody trying to cheat the system, uh, work the system, whatever. Uh, but I, I like what's being presented, and I, I, I would like to see you accept that. On the uh, bonus points, for parties. It does specify in here that if all the members of a party turn in their tags that the bonus point will be restored. But I, in, in this world today, I think you need to say if any portion of the party turns in a tag, the bonus point will not uh, be returned. Uh, given the people that are out there today and their, and their thought uh, process and the fact I oftentimes appreciate hearing that sound because it means a conference call is over. <laughs> but I don't appreciate hearing it during the public meeting. Is that Reno rejoining us? Yes, Reno's rejoining you. <clears throat> okay, uh, Mr. Flowers, you dropped off, I believe, talking about the language of the party hunt where you said any portion of the party hunt returns, then all members of the party uh, lose their bonus points. That's what where you dropped off and the phone disconnected. Okay, uh, Chairman Johnston and uh, commission members. Yeah, I, th I think that you need to state that if a portion of the people in the party return tags, they do not have their bonus points uh, restored. Um, any good attorney would pick it apart if all you had in there is if all members return it, the bonus points would be restored. So I, I think you need to add that language. Thank you. A good attorney will read it however his client wants it read, so. <laughs> and you know how I want it. <laughs> no more comment in Reno, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any public comment here in Las Vegas? Mr. Reese? Chairman, commissioners, let me get my attorney up here with me. Uh, uh, Clark County Cab voted six to nothing on this with the recommendation that as we looked at this, the airline industry deals with this every single day and they've done it for decades. Somebody turns a ticket back in, you go back on, just like Jack Robb is saying, you can go back in and you can look and see if there's any available. If there is, you're the first one in, you got to put it in your cart, it does time out. So you've got to do it, you can't do that and say go to another airline agency and see who's cheaper or whatever. But that was one of the options that we looked at. 
The other option was, because of the software that Calcomini has, <clears throat> we know ahead of time who the alternate list is. If you've got 50 tags left in an area, you can email immediately those 50 people because you've already got it in chronological order. I'm thinking it's in something like an Excel spreadsheet where you can click, highlight, cut, paste, email them right then and there. Question comes up, how much time do we give you to respond back? If we wanted to take it a step farther, we generally have contact information up there. I know it'd be cumbersome to make 1,100 phone calls, but you could say, hey, we'll give you 12 hours or something on an email. I think most people with smartphones and stuff check them 12 times in an hour. So uh, we would really, we, we don't want to disenfranchise anybody into the draw system. Therefore, we would like to weigh in on using the alternate list as much as we can because people are already doing that. We'd probably have to change the wording, like you said, instead of 14 days, are you willing to take an alternate tag, maybe even in a couple days of the season? Um, we didn't go that deep into the conversation, but we really as a cab wanted to see the uh, alternate list because that's how you went in with your bonus points and everything else. We would hate to see somebody that only had one point or no points, hurry up and call in or, or get in on it and actually get a tag. So we're just thinking the alternate list, we already play by the rules of the alternate list. Let's see if we can't stay to, to that. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Okay, so I need, I need, I, is there additional public comment, Mr. Bunch? Glen Bunch, Mineral County. Um, we were like the other counties, we rolled this around quite heavily. Um, this PowerPoint was great. We'd like to have part of that information. However, um, the questions come up, how would this first come, first serve work? And the, some of the comments were made, well, the people that were able to get to the end of our office first is gonna be first in line. And we rolled it around several times and we come up with the fact that the language says it'll be electronically. So our interpretation was that it will be electronically notified off of the alternate list of a tag available. And so that was the way we understood it. And we felt that would be, even though the tag was into the second or third day of the season, it would be up to the alternates to take it. And so anyway, it's, it's got a lot of bugs we got to work out. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Okay, one question I have, it's, it's section five on page 10. It's page 10 and 11, that is the proposed regulatory language for, for the party hunt issue and the return of tag, correct? Because that says if every tag awarded for antelope, bighorn, sheep, mountain goat, black bear, awarded to the members of a party is returned for a season. And every such tag has received at least one business day. So that's the regulatory language that says every tag. Yes, okay. that is correct. So is there a regulatory language that says what happens, where's the regulatory language that says what happens if one member of the party returns the tag? That's currently already in NAC. Um, let me find the chapter. It's NAC 502.4187, which is already included in this regulation as well. It says um, in section one, subsection two, except as otherwise provided in subsections three and four, the bonus points awarded to a person accumulate until the person is successful in drawing a tag for a season for that species or category of species, or the person fails to apply for a season for two consecutive calendar years during which that type of hunt for a season is open. If an applicant is successful in drawing a tag for a season for a species or category of species or fails to apply for a season for two consecutive calendar years during which that hunt is open, the applicant loses all of his or her bonus points. Um, also, I will say LCB does try to be brief, though some of the regulations that come back may not show that. 
I don't believe that they will add in a section for um, what would happen if only one person were to apply when the regulation states that everyone has to turn in their tag in order to qualify for getting their points back. Correct. But that doesn't address if one member of the party turns in the tag and the other people go into the field. So that, that okay, never mind. Any person who turns into the tag in the, in the, in the hunt, they're reduced to zero. Yes. In the party. Okay. Because if the others hunt, they'll be at zero two going into the following year. It's that you don't restore the one person in the party who returns the tag. Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, Deputy Director Rob, you indicated that the department would like to see this in effect. Well, what I'm hearing is we're going to need at least one more workshop on this, especially with the first come, first serve. I don't know what what's the flavor of the commission on that, but or is it a matter of working out the details of the first come, first serve, and is that going to be in the regulation, or is that just going to be in the processing of how this occurs? Jack, right off the record, the first come, first serve does have to be in the regulation, even though a lot of it's going to be business practice. But... We're, we're, this is an idea. And if we come up with a better idea, we're all for it. Uh, many draws don't seem to be the, uh, an option. Notifying the next 10 people on an alternate list, it's not that, it, there, these are some, it, it, we don't have anything programmed in. There's some manual things that have to occur to do some of this. I'm thinking of calcomized time and end out staff time and 1,100 tags, it's not really feasible to do it. Uh, and I'm thinking of the people that they check the box and they say, I'll take a tag up to five days into the season. Now they've already passed the point that they can return the tag. They checked the box six months ago and they're out, they're out of the country or in the middle of a trial or something going on that they didn't anticipate when they checked that box, they've lost all their bonus points because they can't return the tag. The season's already started. I'm just trying to figure out which option breaks the least. We want to fix something, but I don't want to break 10 other things in our fix. Okay. Commissioner Hubbs has a question, then Commissioner East. Yes, I don't. The only thing when I look at, obviously, when I'm assessing these types of arguments, not being a hunter myself, not really knowing, you know, this exchange of tickets, but when we were talking about the transfer, it seemed to me that it came up, and I believe it was you, Kaylee, who stated it last time, that there was a certain time period where you did not want people in the field who were not prepared for a hunt. And this seems like an even more rapid turnaround with just a completely non-associated party. So I just, the rationale here is not making sense to me as to expedite these folks out that may not be prepared for the hunt. Yeah, so I think that would be the problem with what Commissioner Almberg's proposed um, about checking a box like six months ahead of time. Uh, I personally would be not willing to check that box six months ahead of time and then receive a tag two days into a hunt and not have enough time to request that time off. But if I'm going into my account knowing that there's a tag open with two days ahead of time, I have that opportunity before I purchase that tag to ask my boss um, for those days off. Um, that's what comes to my mind as far as the concern about having people in the field who weren't prepared um, was when we discussed transferring a tag to a family member because I had suggested that most likely a family member is going to um, have been preparing for that hunt with the tag holder, probably have scouted with that tag holder, and therefore would be more prepared to get that tag transferred to them. Whereas if that person could just transfer the tag to anyone, um, it could be to someone who didn't go scouting with them or who isn't prepared and who doesn't have the time off work. So, so how are these people who are buying it, this first come first serve, more prepared than another third party. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me because we don't know how prepared any of these folks are. Probably some are really prepared and know exactly where they're going and what to do, but 
I didn't know if there was a fear that that's some, something that is harmful to do to put somebody out in the field who's not very prepared or kind of it's a haphazard last minute trip. Yeah, I think it's kind of a subjective thing. I mean, um, I don't think someone who's not prepared to go out into the field in two days would buy a tag <laughs> that starts in two days. But um, there certainly are people who have scouted all over Nevada and who would be prepared. And I think those people would be the ones to buy that tag. Jack Rob, for the record, I was on the TAC committee when the 14 days was put in, and I lost the argument. I wanted it to be up to the day the season started. But this is in place now, and I've seen how my life's changed, and at the point that I had that argument, I would take it up to the point that the season started. I was in a different position. I owned my own company. I could be that flexible. Sitting in a state agency where my calendar is set by other things, I couldn't check that box now. So I, if it was a, the day of, I would have to exclude myself from some of those. It, it just, what I argued in the past is different than what I'm arguing today because my life has changed. I, I don't, the, the preparation issue to me is a, is a non-issue. When the, when the tags come available on a first come, first serve, the people who are likely evaluating these tags, they're gonna see what's available, what unit it's in. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna just click it and take it haphazard, lose their bonus points, pay the money for the tag. They're gonna say, okay, this is something I can do. My calendar's clear, I have the flexibility, or it's near where I live. I, I, can, I can do this, I don't have to throw together camp or whatever, but I can tell you from my own, you know, if someone told me you need to leave tomorrow, I go to a garage, everything's in a box, it gets thrown in the back of my pickup and I'm on the road. I mean, that's just the way my stuff's kept. So, and I know a lot of people who are exactly like that. Um, so I don't think it's just gonna be this haphazard, oh, you know, this tag came available, I'm just gonna buy it and wing it. I just. I, I brought that up because that was an argument made in the transfer where you transfer it to a third party. And so I, the timing issue and the preparedness. And so if that was a rationale at that point, I was wondering why it was lacking in this capacity when we're talking about first come first serve because it's an even shorter period of time and we have no idea who who's prepared or not in that realm. So it just doesn't, it's just different. The rationale doesn't match. So I was wanting to know why. And Commissioner Olmberg? Yeah, I guess I, I agree. I mean, there, there will be people that'll make, that are willing to accept the risk. And so as I view this, there's an alternate one list and an alternate two list. Alternate two list, that 14 day period, is that you're willing to, even if it's six month, you're willing to say, hey, I'm risking bonus points. I'm risking my application fee. I want on that list for that hunt if it becomes available, whether it's five days into the season or otherwise, I'm willing to take it. And once that list is exhausted, it might be pretty minimal, but at least we've, we've afforded that opportunity to, for the people to make that choice. Uh, that's their choice that, that they make. And then you move on to the first come, first serve. Once you've exhausted this, you know, the second list that's a little bit deeper and a little bit more. So, you know, the, the first list is, is what I, I envision is what we have now. People up to 14 days, you know, they'll, they, they get an alternate, automatically it comes in the mail, but in this 14 day window, it's gonna be an email saying, hey, you got the tag, it's on its way, you make plans, you, you go, if that's what they choose. So there's, you know, there's two different lists, basically, as how I would envision, you know, this pre-14 and this 14 day period. Commissioner East. Thank you. Could you do an opt-in at a certain point and send that to all unsuccessful hunters in that hunt? Could you say within the next three weeks there could be this many tags become available? <coughs> Opt in if you want to be on the list for receiving a late <coughs> tag. Not a late, but you know what I mean. Um, could you do an opt-in so that then you can take yourself off of it 
I guess I'm just, I'm thinking that it's got to be fair. People, somebody who gets a, who goes out and gets hunter safety in, in July can then go ahead and hunt if they can, if they're an alternate or if they opt in to get this tag, where somebody who's been waiting and waiting and waiting has a better chance. Am I right or am I wrong? Jack Rob, for the record, we can do anything. It's what's the cost and, and like I said, I'm trying to not break anything worse and some of the options would break stuff worse. Well, the costs are already of, losing all, money. And I, Calcomy is in the room. We have Zach and Chet here and I can't commit them to building something I have talked to them about the first come first serve option. I believe we could do the two alternates as Commissioner Allberg suggested, mm -hmm. but I'd want them to weigh in because I'm not going to commit them to something without talking to them first. Do they want to come down? Apparently not. No. Nope. They're both shy. <laughs> They're not shy. I also just want to note really quickly, um, if this were not to be moved to an adoption next meeting, we would move, by the time it was adopted and ledge commission met, we would be in a temporary reg period. So that's just something for you guys to consider also. Chet Van Dallen, for the record, for Calcomai. It's a little different than last time I was up here. Um, so technically, we can, we can build a system that can do anything within reason that you'd like it to do. Uh, Jack's mention of the current contract has none of this technically in scope. If we create a new product, some sort of new first come first serve product, we would probably have to look at some sort of pricing implications. If we were gonna run multiple draws, would you charge for applications? Um, executing the draw functionality is already there. So whether it's one main draw or a hundred um, mini draws, the functionality can be built or it's already in place, but the cost uh, to the customer and therefore the cost to the state is, hasn't been discussed. So that's the implication on that side. If you want that for this year, we have until August. So if we kick this uh, to a vote to March or even to the one after that, that becomes a development crunch where we are running into some serious uh, concerns about having the system built and adapted in time for, for August or July really if it's 14 days prior. So there is some concern there. So if this is something that needs to be implemented this year and we are looking at a pretty big overhaul of how to handle these types of tags, the quicker decision is better. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I kind of like the direction that Commissioner Allenberg is uh, going with, the, with the, the second alternate list. I mean, it's a personal choice. If people want to roll the dice and, you know, they have that choice. It's uh, um, I think that it helps alleviate some of that and then ultimately go to a first come first serve if you have to. But if they're, I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing out, you know, that, that sounded like a, something worthy of pursuing or talking about or discussion. That's just. Currently you check the alternate when you do your application. That is correct. So the implication on the current alternate box is that if the tag is returned two weeks prior to the hunt, you will get that tag. You've made your choice at application in April. So come August, September, November, you will get that tag. If we're talking about a tag that could happen today, we're probably talking about some sort of secondary alternate, which then requires messaging, prevent confusion, things like that. Hubs. I've had my ticket stolen, had it in my queue, and it was taken. So I've seen how that is done. If you spend a little bit of, it's a very fast process with airlines. I um, there's also um, software I know that can detect hit 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 from certain devices. Um, so if you're worried about manipulating um, 
somebody coming in and manipulating, hanging out online all day long, trying to get a ticket as fast as they can, you can actually block devices that are trying to do that to your system. I don't know if you have anything like that for your system, but it's not that difficult to do that. Yeah, so Chet Van Deller for Calcomy. Um, we can certainly discuss security concerns. If, if the goal is to put the tag in the hand of anybody, then is that a problem? We're not, we can't answer that. That's up to the state. It's up to the commission to answer that. Um, if the goal is to prevent some sort of bot spamming technology, we can look into to how we would circumvent that. But um, it's, it's really up to the state, today. yeah. So we, we have security that can pre prevent that, but if the goal is to just put the ticket or the tag in the field, the state has to answer, do they care who gets it? it eligible hunter, of course, right? It's not anybody, but yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't know if you wanna go too far, <laughs> but. Comments or questions, Commissioner Hums? I guess for, for, from my perspective, I, I agree with that Deputy Director Rob. I think that uh, potentially that might need to be changed, uh, but if we want to do it rapidly, I know that system is already in place and used for that purpose, and if you want to, I mean, sometimes that's analysis paralysis when you're under a uh, deadline, if you're trying to utilize it this year, maybe we just use what we already have and reassess at a later date. Jack or off for the record. I, I, I need to clarify something. We've, we're talking about the two weeks. It's, it's 14 calendar days and I received a return tag, a return deer tag this year, I drew it as an alternate and I couldn't go on that hunt and I turned it in like 17 days before the hunt started. But because we couldn't, it's to 14 days as we say we will notify the customer within 14 days. And the way the business practices work now, we've got, we have to make it more efficient within Endow. I returned a tag with 17 days before the season started. It wasn't reissued this year because our business practice did not let us get there. To notify the customer within 14 days, it would have taken too long. So uh, Division Administrator Munoz has gone to great lengths to define what our process is internally to look at how we can take some of these days off of it. I, I don't know how many people touched, I think it was eight people over a seven day period touched that return tag to make something happen to get it to the next person. So these, uh, it, it should be easier than it is, but when you apply state laws and you apply business rules and you apply everything you do, it really becomes cumbersome on staff. And we're trying to simplify that. And my tag that I returned 17 days before the season was not reissued last year. So these are some of the things we're trying to figure out. Any other further questions or comments? If I am hearing the, there's no real objection, it's how is the first come first serve carried out and otherwise the regulation is all the concepts are okay. So I would perhaps, since this is the first workshop and I know we try to avoid workshops and adoption hearings back to back, but that's typically when we don't want to have the first workshop on Friday and the adoption hearing on Saturday. So would it be possible for us in connection with the March meeting to bring this back for a second workshop on Friday, put on the agenda adoption hearing on Saturday. That would give the public more time to give input on this issue. The commissioners in the department more time to 
the commissioners can think about it in advance of that and get the public input, whatever's communicated to them. The department can tell us what they think is the most feasible way to carry out. And that way we, that doesn't mean we have to go to the adoption on Saturday, but, or, but it gives us the option to do so after a second workshop on Friday. I would just like to make sure that our deputy attorney general is okay with that. He's, okay. I always look out of my corner of the eye, okay. eye and if, he, if he's nodding. I just caution against yeah. that usually, so I, I wanted yeah. to make sure I, he's good with that. It, and I do, I do remember times when there was the workshop on Friday, but it was the first workshop, and the adoption hearing was the next day, and that created a lot of riff with public input because there, you didn't get enough to work it out. It seems to me with what we've heard today, and like I said, it doesn't mean then you're automatically gonna adopt anything on Saturday. It gives us the option to do so by having it properly agendized. Mm -hmm. It also gives us the opportunity to have the second workshop on Friday. So if everyone is okay with that, that would be my suggestion for what we do in the March meeting with respect to this regulation. Mr. I don't Chairman. see. Secretary Wesley. Uh, my, just for clarification, um, I, I support that. I think it's a, a good direction to go. Um, I'll just reference uh, earlier statement in the uh, department activity report that that draw does open on March 16th. We're talking about a meeting on March 20th. So that would also affect the recommendations, the specific recommendations coming forward by the department. So I don't intend that to be pressure in any way, shape, or form to do anything. Just full disclosure that some of the options that have been discussed here, like the second checkoff box uh, may not be implementable at that point because of the timing if the commission does go forward on that. Understood. And I will express my personal view that the second checkoff box, I think, can present some serious problems in that we don't alleviate the issue we're trying to do so that, for example, you have the standard 14 days in advance. We'll, we'll notify you 14 days in advance. Or then there's alternative, I'll take it up to three days before the hunt begins. Tags issued. I'm going to return it. Now we got the return tag, even though we've extended the second alternate option and we're not still not getting the tag into people's hands. Where the idea of having the first come, first serve, where the specific tag is identified online, I understand people worried about, however, people, I'm not one to ask, clicking, clicking, or some program to do that. But then it's a specific, here is is, here is what is now available, and people make the decision, yes, I want to purchase that. It's a much more informed decision in that tight window period of 14 days to say, yes, I'm prepared to take that because it's in this unit on these days. Um, so with that, I think we can close the workshop, though. We'll agendize it as I suggested for a workshop on Friday and an adoption hearing on Saturday, and we'll see where we get further feedback in that. And I understand, Secretary Wosley, where we're at in terms of the application process, but we weren't going to adopt this today anyway, so it's not as though, and I understand if we don't adopt it, then we're in the temporary regulation, but I would rather do something longer in time and get it right than do something shorter in time to meet a deadline of temporary versus permanent reg. Um, I just want to clarify, though, you don't want us to make any changes to the regulation before the next workshop. I don't hear any. So at this point, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, We'll move on to agenda item number nine, committee reports informational. Agenda item 9A, landowner compensation tag committee report, commissioner and committee chair Brad Johnston informational. A report will be provided on the committee's recent meeting held on January 24th, 2020. Um, the landowner compensation tag committee met uh, this morning uh, prior to the commission meeting. It was a rather short meeting. I think it lasted all of 15 minutes. Uh, as you might recall, one of the issues that the this committee did and has already presented to this commission, and I believe maybe on the agenda tomorrow, it is what happens when the statutory cap is hit 
for landowner compensation tags, and we came up with a simple formula to address that scenario. The second issue that really came up during the course of the work that the committee was doing to, was to make sure there was a protocol established as to how these counts are conducted throughout the state. And, and then you start getting into issues that you don't necessarily think about until you're sitting on the committee. Well, what about the landowner who has two different pieces of property that aren't necessarily adjacent? Are they counted at the same time, different points of time? Or what about the property owner who has one ranch in one hunt unit and one ranch in another hunt unit? Uh, these all are scenarios that exist and the department provided uh, a protocol that would be followed what the landowners have to do in terms of when the com counts can be combined, when they cannot be combined, and that would be the protocol that would be followed. So we'll bring that protocol to this commission to, for review uh, at the March meeting. Uh, it's, it's, it's fairly simplistic. It's a couple pages long. Uh, it's black and white, uh, and there was not much discussion or debate about it as everyone was on board. With that, if the commission will, is comfortable with that protocol when it's presented to it, uh, that would then be the end of the landowner compensation tag committee as we've worked through the issues, heard from the stakeholders, addressed the issues that we thought needed to be addressed because as we got into it, the committee was very comfortable, really from input on all sides, that there was no need to make wholesale changes to the program but that, yes, in fact, we needed to address the statutory cap, and yes, we wanted to have a confirmed protocol that's being followed when these counts are done so that everybody is aware, both uh, all stakeholders, the landowners, everyone, the department, how these were to be done. And so that's where that stands. Um, I don't know if any other committee members or Mr. Scott have anything to add to that. Okay, with that then, I will move on to agenda item 9B, the Regulation Simplification Committee Report, Commissioner and Committee Chair Brad Johnston, informational. A report will be provided on the committee's recent meeting held on January 24th, 2020. Following the Landowner Compensation Tag Committee, the Regulation Simplification Committee um, met for the first time. That commission is uh, Vice Chair East, myself, and Commissioner Cavilia. Um, we had a presentation from the department who has already consulted with LCB as to how to proceed. It was noted that a number of cleanup and simplification issues were noted by the department during the license simplification process. But since the focus of that process was license simplification, we did not want to complicate that process, which was completed uh, with other simplification issues. And one of the things we are going to try to do is prioritize issues to be addressed by chapters in the NAC, including boating regulations and all the other wildlife regulations that we have. Uh, also inviting the CABs, other stakeholders, members of the public to provide their input, much in the way the TAC committee worked off a TAC topic list and then prioritizing things for simplification as the TAC committee did, with the hope that we could tackle the major issues in one chapter of an, the NAC at a time, because that has been the request of LCB. The other thing I tried to remind people, though, is we're not trying to rewrite the regulations, so we want to stay true to what the task of the committee is, which is simplifying and clarifying regulations that are in need of that simplification and clarification. So um, with that, it was a kind of a starting point, but we will meet again in March in connection with the commission meeting at that time. I don't know if Mr. Cavilia, Deputy Director Rob, Ms. Taylor, or Vice Chair East have anything to add. Okay, with that, we'll close out agenda item nine and move on to agenda item 10, public comment period. Persons wishing to speak are requested to complete a speaker's card and present it to the recording secretary. No action can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Do we have any public comment in Elko? No public comment in Elko. Thank you, Mr. Cooney. Any public comment in Reno. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Yes, this is Karen Jalo, a resident of Washoe County. I am co uh, commenting on a couple things. The first one is uh, concerning the rebound of the wetlands bird that was mentioned um, earlier. And I agree, yes, we need to say thank you to the sportsmen. But let's also not forget the uh, Obama era regulations um, that helped the rebound of the birds. And also uh, those regulations, I guess, recently have been rescinded by Mr. Trump. Uh, concerning the uh, earlier discussion on ethics and the written declarations in other states, um, most hunters are extremely ethical, um, hands down. However, um, hunting will not be considered completely ethical until it can separate itself from the complete destruction and lack of respect for wildlife that's shown by a killing contest. It would be very interesting to find out what uh, charities benefit from such unethical activities. Uh, trapping, trapping for the fur industry by its very nature is unethical. No fair chase, 96 hours in a trap. The non-target data is staggering and um, unlimited capture. Uh, based on the information given earlier, how many law enforcement hours are being burned by the trappers who can't seem to get it together and follow the law? The non-target data shows the wanton destruction of trapping. Uh, the complete reliance on self-report techniques shows the irrelevancy of trapping. What is this board going to do about the wanton waste of all of this wildlife? Uh, last November, we saw a great film about wildlife crossing corridors, and a quote from the film was, and this is a quote, when did this become okay? When did all the non-target data become okay and not be addressed by this board? When did all the wanton destruction of the killing contest become okay? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Additional public comment in Reno? Yes, for the record, Carla Kialga, representing Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Chairman Johnston, members of the board, I was very encouraged to hear in Mr. Janae's report the plan to bring a sagebrush conservation initiative to you in the near future. As you know, healthy, functioning sagebrush habitat is the key to so many important wildlife species in Nevada. The four cornerstones Alan laid out for you are such important issues that are the focus of much effort and resources throughout the West today. Without a way or ways to conserve those values, those sagebrush dependent species will suffer. One of those cornerstones, the connectivity of species and habitat, is something my organization and many others have been working on all over the West. Nevada, Nevada Department of Wildlife is recognized as a leader in this arena because of the work they've been doing documenting and prioritizing ungulate migration corridors and construction constructing highway crossings with Nevada Department of Transportation. NDOW is the envy of other states who have only recently begun working on the issue. Regardless of what form this sagebrush conservation initiative takes, I trust it will be well thought out and science-based. TRCP welcomes this initiative, and I want to formally make the offer to assist in this endeavor in any way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment? Uh, no more comment in Reno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, any public comment here in Las Vegas? For the record, Logan Stam, Backcountry Hunters in English. Uh, this comment is in regards to the Sage Risk sagebrush conservation initiative that was proposed. Nevada is home to robust populations of migrating wildlife. The sportsmen and women have worked hand in hand with Endow to conserve over the past many years. This includes mule deer, elk, bighorn sheep, and pronghorn. However, these ecosystems, these migrating animals rely on are still facing significant challenges. Nevada's sagebrush ecosystem is one of the most imperiled in the U.S. and the loss of healthy habitat comes from conversion to conifer woodlands, exotic and invasive grasses, wildfires, and ever-increasing human developments. <coughs> The vast majority of Nevada's sagebrush ecosystem is on public land managed by the BLM. Because of the great work NDOW has undertaken over the past years, cultivating new science and analysis relating to wildlife, wildlife movement, habitat, 
we have an opportunity to address some of these challenges that faces Nevada's sagebrush ecosystem. This new data puts Endo in the driver's seat to use this science in collaboration with federal agencies to influence federal land management decisions, notably to better conserve critical migratory routes for big game animals. Since 2011, Nevada has initiated a multitude of large-scale research efforts to investigate potential causes for our declining mule deer populations in several key herds across the state. The De Department of Wildlife has been on the forefront of using new technologies to track ungulate movements, providing new conclusions into how these animals utilize Nevada's landscapes. This new information regarding when and where animals use seasonal and migratory habitat in relation to land tenure, land use, and transportation features has implications for science-informed conservation on Nevada's sagebrush ecosystem. Nevada has long re recognized the importance of identifying and conserving crucial habitat for big game, including migration corridors and winter range. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers wants to take this opportunity to voice our support for this work. The membership of BHA values the traditions and heritage of our wildlands, waters, and wildlife. BHA hopes to, move, <clears throat> hopes to work in coordination with Endow moving forward to identify science-based solutions that can provide Endow the needed tools to address issues for our imperiled sagebrush ecosystem for the benefit of our wildlife. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment in Las Vegas? Okay. Mr. Volz. Good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, Fred Volz. A, a committee of the commission spent time discussing regulation simplification today. What hasn't been discussed is the commission's committee structure and overdue revisions. The Elk Damage and Incentive Committee last met on November 12, 2013, over six years ago. It clearly has no pressing business to conduct. If there is any new business, then it can be handled by the Elk Management Committee. The same applies to the Elk Subplanning and Elk Arbitration Subcommittees, which have not met since April 12, 2016 and June 27, 2016, respectively. The Wildlife Scholarship Recipient Selection Committee has not met since March 15, 2013. It too needs to be disbanded. At the same time, two committees that have been disbanded failed to resolve the ongoing problems with trapping and bears. The problems and lawsuits just keep occurring. Previous commissions tired of dealing with the subjects and hoped the problems would just disappear on their own. That hasn't happened. Newly formatted committees or some other workable construct that actually addresses the problems would be something to add to a future commission meeting. One step forward would be to task the Endow Executive Director with requesting that Governor Sisolak have his personal representative on the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency agendize the following subject. The Governor's call would be for meaningful action in resolving the dangerous wildlife and urban areas problem around Lake Tahoe. As you may know, TURPA is the only government agency with authority over both California and Nevada. Wildlife is artificially attracted by uncontained human trash from the wilderness into the basin's urban areas. Free food is a powerful draw. Endow kills bears deemed to be nuisances, and other bears die as they successfully, unsuccessfully attempt to cross busy highways. Other wildlife species meet a similar fate. The simple solution would be mandatory wildlife-proof containers throughout the basin. None of the local politicos, save those in Incline Village, have been interested in doing anything comprehensive to stop the carnage stretching back more than two decades. Since the Commission's primary job is to protect, preserve, and manage wildlife, not just figure out ways to promote more hunter killing, this task falls squarely in your purview. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will be adjourned and we will reconvene tomorrow morning at 8.30. Thank you, everybody.